Our next lecturer uh, will be Jared Young. He's an associate professor, associate professor here. He joined us in 2006, works with uh, a group, as you've heard, uh, including Mark Geyer, uh, joined the faculty in 2009, but was here for training before that. Uh, he has created uh, numerous tests of cognition and behavior and a cross-sectional, uh, excuse me, a cross-species battery and translational research has been also a theme that we've heard a great deal about uh, these last couple of days, where he's combining fMRI and EEG measures in brain functioning. Uh, his lecture, <clears throat> his lecture is titled uh, Forward and Reverse Translational Research to delineate neural underpinnings of cognitive dysfunction in psychiatric disorders. So, Jared. Thank you, um, and thank you, Mark, for that introduction, and very uh, appreciative of the opportunity to speak to you all today about some of the work that I've done since my arrival here at UCSD. As mentioned, I'll be talking about some of the cognitive research we've been uh, going on with. Now, of course, you've heard a lot of people's origin story, the department's origin story, and everyone has their own origin story. Mine's not as exciting as some others, I could mention, um, but mine, as you might guess from the accent, does come from far away. I originally did my PhD at the University of Edinburgh, and um, uh, I was assessing cognitive performance in mice at the time using a five-choice serial reaction time task, a test of attention. Around that time, the FDA recognized that there was a, a link between cognitive functioning in patients with schizophrenia and a really a need to treat this cognitive dysfunction that occurs. And Mark Geyer, uh, whom you've heard of, um, heard from, was heavily involved in the Matrix Initiative in order to really push forward the ability to measure cognitive dysfunction in patients with schizophrenia. And, this, uh, and around that time, um, both he and Dr. Victoria Risborough reached out to me because they were wanting to assess cognitive functioning in mice to take further forward their schizophrenia research. As I mentioned, I was doing my PhD. I was actually close to finishing my PhD. So I said, of course, I'm more than happy to help out such esteemed uh, researchers, but uh, I'm just about to finish my PhD. I'm looking for a postdoc. I could just come and do it for you. Um, and... That was the shortest interview I ever had. Um, I've arrived soon thereafter and I've been here ever since and I'm hugely appreciative of them for taking a chance on me. This uh, work that I've been doing obviously and guides a lot of our own research um, has been the guiding principle of my research as well, that mental illness is ubiquitous across societies. Uh, severely debilitating mental illness occurs in a large proportion of the population. And I think part of the thing that was most poignant to me is that uh, such mental illnesses occur at the time where people really are in the early prime of their lives. At the time I was moving across continent, across country to come start my PhD, many others have been suffering uh, with psychiatric conditions and being told that they're going to have a chronic, lifelong, life-threatening illness. And really that has driven a lot of my interest in research and my need to understand the, the combined genetic and environmental causes of these effects. As we've mentioned, and as you've already heard, the neurocognitive deficits that occur in many of these disorders link closely to the functional, uh, patient's functional outcome. So the basis is that if we can identify the neural mechanisms um, underlying the behavior, you heard work from Larry Squire showing how that can be done well across species, we can then develop valid model organisms, RP mentioned one earlier, and ultimately we want to test uh, potential therapeutics to these new targets. Now, as mentioned, dopamine is incredibly important throughout the system. It's important for everyday functioning, but also uh, for cognitive uh, assessment. I just want to mention uh, the dopamine transporter, the importance for it in clearing dopamine and its homeostatic control. A hyperdopaminergic state, or reduced dopamine transporter expression, would result in a hyperdopaminergic state and lead to elevated activation of postsynaptic dopamine receptors, perhaps unwarranted. It's actually work in our own department by Tiffany Greenwood and John Kelso that, that demonstrated polymorphisms of this dopamine transporter have been linked to bipolar disorder. And in fact, other groups show that these polymorphisms likely lead to a redu reduced expression of dopamine transporter, and that was confirmed in PET imaging. And obviously, we want to understand what the impact of this hyperdopaminergic state would have. 
you've already seen these slides, but it was really a great opportunity for me when I first arrived. I was to set up cognitive testing, it takes quite a while, and Mark got me involved with both uh, Bill Perry and Arpin Manassian and the TriPEC group, really to demonstrate how you can quite simply conduct behavioral uh, analyses in patients and in animals across species. And this work was incredibly fruitful um, and um, has led to numerous publications and a great body of research. You heard from it already, I'm not going to go into these details, but it really sets the scene of being able to start um, developing animal models of psychiatric conditions. But I was primarily interested in and brought over to assess cognitive functioning. One of the primary interests is that of attentional functioning, which you've heard about. Um, uh, attentional functioning is commonly assessed in uh, psychiatric patients using the continuous performance test, which really is an umbrella term for many different tasks that all share the same basic construct. You're presented with a visual field, you have to um, press whenever a target appears, but then if a non-target appears, say an X, you shouldn't respond. But keep responding when targets appear. And as you go along, you realize that you have to respond and inhibit from responding to different stimuli, and it's something that's obviously difficult for patients with psychiatric conditions. At the time, and um, the task that I mentioned earlier on, the 5CSR task, it was really the, the common test of attentional functioning in rodents. And the 5CSR is just a, an operant chamber, and there's five holes. Whenever a light appears, the animal has to make a response. It's really that simple. One of the key components you'll, uh, you can hear that I'm saying, everything is responding. At no point in time, unlike the CPTs, does the animal have to inhibit from responding. So I took another chance, and when Mark asked me to set this up, I said, well, I could give you this, but I could give you something that's probably a little bit better, and we could introduce a non-target stimulus. And then when all five lights come on, the animal has to inhibit from responding. And that way we get measurements of hits and misses like the 5CSR, but now we get measurements of false alarms and correct rejections. And just like in human research, we get the opportunity to use signal detection theory to really understand the attentional performance. And thankfully, we can generate measures of deep prime and bias. And thankfully, uh, Greg Light in the department was here and on hand to teach me how to do signal detection theory for these studies. Um, Mark, as I said, took that chance and let me do it. But of course, as a good mentor, he said, OK, but give me the five CSR at the same time. We did the five choice CPT, though. We showed it worked pretty well. We validated it. We've published on it any number of times. Sleep deprivation, as you might imagine, impairs performance in humans and in mice. Amphetamine improves performance in humans and mice. And we've done a, a lot of other work validating this task and helping others across the globe set it up and publish their findings. And it was also recommended by the Centrix and Numeds for schizophrenia research. So it's really been a, a great opportunity for me to develop some of these tasks and validate them. And I mentioned the dopamine transporter knockdown mice. They have a very consistent pattern of activity as patients with, uh, with bipolar disorder. What about their attentional functioning? Well, we trained them and tested them in this five-choice CPT task. And what we found was, as you might, uh, you might expect, they have an elevated emission level. Basically, as targets appear, they're less likely to respond to the targets. Whenever non-targets appear, however, they're more likely to respond to non-targets. So they have this response disinhibition component as well. And that means overall, their overall performance from signal detection theory is significantly worse than their wild-type litter mates. These are mice with a 10% uh, uh, expression of dopamine transporters, so they're really hyperdopaminergic. And what was interesting is when we tested them in the very simple 5CSR task, that is when it just always requires responding, they were actually better in the task as measured by fewer misses to targets. So it's really when we introduced the non-targets that the performance fell apart in these mice, highlighting the importance for this cross-species translational research measuring the same cognitive domain. When um, I presented some of this work at a MIREC meeting, actually I followed a talk by David Braff um, asking the question, do rodents cognate? So that was fun to follow. Um, during that time, though, it was a great opportunity for me because um, I presented the five-choice CPT. I highlighted that it's not the same as other CPTs. There are differences. And um, I was fortunate to uh, have Dr. Lisa Eiler come up to me and say, well, why don't you develop a human version of it? And so we did. And in work with uh, the TriPEC group and with Lisa Eiler, we've actually developed this human version where we tested in patients with acutely, uh, that are acutely ill with bipolar disorder and compared them to healthy comparison subjects. And as you can see here, much like our, our dopamine transporter knockdown mice, they have a lower hit rate, that is the, 
They have fewer uh, target responses than their healthy comparison subjects. They have a higher rate of false alarm responses. And so they have overall poor vigilance. And much like our knockdowns, they had no change in their bias. And it was really uh, the Lisa's suggestion in the first place and what has led to an fMRI compatible version of this where we, we saw a deficient parietal function in people with bipolar disorder. So it's given us this opportunity to do cross-species research, but also where we're doing lesion work in mice, we can do fMRI in patients. Now that's one measure of attentional functioning. There are many others. And I just want to uh, show you one more uh, task that we developed. Uh, we wanted to measure risk preference. This is obviously a critical factor in mania and bipolar disorder. We want people to make the right decisions. And it's a, uh, something that can be measured using an Iowa gambling task. It's a real-world measurement of risk preference in people. You present them with four decks of cards, say labeled A through D, and subjects are told, please maximize your, uh, your winnings. So if they pick a card, that's pretty much all they're told. And they pick a card, and what you find is, hey, I got $100 if I pick A. And say they pick D, maybe they'll get more, maybe they'll get less, and they find they get $50. Well, naturally, over time, they begin to learn that A and B are going to give you 100 C and D will give you less, but actually, A and B give you more punishment disproportionately. And so people learn this fairly quickly. So um, this is the different score in choices, up being less risky, down being more risky. What you see is relative to chance, healthy subjects will soon begin to select from, a and, uh, from C and D and start avoiding those high-risk options, despite the higher rewards. In our patients with bipolar mania, you see this is significantly less so, and that's also true for the euthymics. And really, we learned it was driven um, by the um, patient's inability to learn. When we tested the mice in this task, you might wonder, how do we actually perform such a cognitive task in mice? Well, we have a, a five-choice operant chamber, so we just got rid of one of the, box, one of the holes, and um, we provided them with the four options, just as we did with humans. And this work was primarily in collaboration with Catherine and Stanley, where we provide one reward for the low reward side, we provide two rewards for the high reward side, and really we can perform it the same way. The punishment, obviously we can't take the rewards away from them, um, but we can provide them with a timeout period, which, believe me, is incredibly irritating. The light flashes on and off and on and off from anywhere between 6 and 132 seconds. Um, I'll shorten it. So when we do it in the mice, what you see, much like we see in humans, mice quickly learn to select the less risky site. And our dopamine transporter knockdown mice showed the same pattern of deficits that we saw in our patients with bipolar mania. So from this very basic, uh, from this very basic um, uh, behavioral pattern monitor model, we've learned that this, when you severely reduce the dopamine transporter levels, you get uh, a similarity to what we see in patients with bipolar mania, not only at the exploratory level, but also at the cognitive deficits and the risk preferring. But of course, these mice are always that way. They're always hyperactive. Um, one key question we've always had is, what underlies the switches between states? in bipolar disorder, where we see uh, mania and we see uh, periods of depression. Well, um, coming from Scotland, um, we, um, one thing that has been clear to me is the effect that uh, seasons can have on behavior. Believe me, when you're in going to school in the morning and it's still dark, uh, and it's dark in the morning when you walk to school at 9 a.m., and it's dark in the evening at 3 p.m. when you're walking home and you haven't seen the day, uh, any daylight because you only get three hours in Scotland, you really begin to learn the impact that daylight has. And for those of us driving in today when we enjoyed the sun yesterday but really depressing with all of the rain today, we, um, we see that also in bipolar mania but in an extreme case where people... Uh, with bipolar disorder, as they enter into spring and summer, there are more incidences of mania, but as they enter into winter, you see more incidences of depression. And actually, maintaining stability of photo period is one of the um, treatments for bipolar disorder. Now, I was thinking this might be a way to try and instigate changes between states in, in a mouse model, but I didn't understand any what the mechanism might be until I saw a talk by uh, Dr. Dave, David A. Dolchus, uh, who unfortunately can't be with us, but um, he presented some of his work uh, in rats where he put them into a summer-like or a normal-like or winter-like photo period and showed that the rat's behavior changed, but more importantly, so did the neurotransmitter switch between states in each of these conditions. 
uh, and work done by Dr. Zachary Cope in my lab um, really showed that if we put animals into a normal 12-hour uh, light and dark cycle, we see a normal expression of tyrosine hydroxylase, the rate, limi rate limiting enzyme for uh, dopamine production. But if we put them into a winter-like photo period, that has long periods of darkness and inactivity, or long periods of light, but for mice, inactivity, you see a reduced expression of this tyrosine hydroxylase. But if you put them into what would be a summer-like photo period, a long active photo period, you see this increased expression of tyrosine hydroxylase, and that's quantified here. So just changing the photo period of the length of the light for the mice changed this tyrosine hydroxylase expression, and it did the opposite to somatostatin expression and CRF. So in those in the winter light photo period had more somatostatin and CRF, and it similarly drove behavior in these animals. What was really interesting is Nick Spitzer, who uh, uh, published some of that work, um, then took this idea and said, well, what about, we see it in rats, we see it in mice, what about humans? And they assessed the uh, tyrosine hydroxylase positive and negative neurons in people that died of natural causes in extreme photo period lengths. Where did he go and do that work? Quite nicely, he went to Scotland. People that died in summer and people that died in winter, if you look at the left, here are the individuals plotted, but if you look at the left, People that died in the summer of natural causes had significantly higher levels of tyrosine hydroxylase positive neurons versus those that died in winter, and vice versa for TH negative neurons. So from rats to mice to humans, we see this same physiological effect. And in terms of hypersensitivity, instead of looking at mice that have 90% uh, reduction in dopamine transporters, we looked at those with 40% reduction, and we showed that they had this hypersensitivity to this changing photoperiod effect. So those that were put in the summer-like were taking more risks with the open arm entries. Those that were put in the winter-like condition showed more despair-related behavior in terms of immobility, suggesting that there's some interaction between photoperiod and genotype that might underlie these behaviors. So it just leads me to summarize. Um, it's been wonderful to be at UCSD. It's the reason I haven't left in 13 years, um, and I hope to be here for a lot longer. The collaborative atmosphere, as you've heard, and I want to reiterate, has been wonderful. I've worked with groups from MyRec, Tripex, IRA, and others, and additionally, uh, the TMARC group, as well as working in uh, numerous uh, patient populations. The opportunity, opportunity for me here has been fantastic. Um, I'm moving into other research areas and things that I'm interested in, but feel free to contact me if you want to discuss any of them. Um, but more importantly, I want to highlight the fact that um, I spoke about my origin story, but I never would have done any of this without all of the wonderful support that I've had at, the, at UCSD. Everyone can have their own origin story, but really it's the team that does the work. Um, thank you all for your time. Very interesting series of talks. And again, what this emphasized, collegiality uh, and translational work. Uh, and it's uh, remarkable. Glad you're here with us. Thank you.